What do you see on this CT scan of the brain? This is a scan of a 28-year-old woman who came into the emergency department with a severe sudden headache and weakness on the side of her body. And the scan shows a large right-sided intracerebral hemorrhage with blood pouring into her ventricles, a life threatening bleed. But the question here is, why did this happen? She has no trauma, no past medical history, no high blood pressure, nothing. And the answer lies into a tangled web inside of her brain, something called an arterial venous malformation. October is AVM Awareness Month, so let's talk about it. Your, your brain's blood flow is kind of like a plumbing system. Blood goes into the arteries, these high pressured pipes, into something called the capillaries. That's a slow zone where oxygen and nutrients can exchange and deliver blood to the brain, and then it goes back out of the brain through the veins into the heart. Now, an AVM, that middle step is missing, those capillaries are gone. And instead, you have the arteries that are directly connected to the veins, and it's kind of like blood shooting through a water hose into a straw. And those fragile veins simply aren't built for that kind of pressure. Over time, they can stretch, bulge, or even burst, can, can cause bleeding into the brain or something called a hemorrhage. Now, it can also steal blood from nearby brain tissue, so parts of the brain don't get oxygen. So that's why sometimes symptoms aren't always a bleed. It can cause headaches, seizures, weakness, or even sudden collapse. Now, it's a rare condition with about 1 in 100,000 people per year getting diagnosed. But when it happens, it can be devastating. And about 50% of these AVMs are discovered because they bleed. Most AVMs are congenital, meaning you're born with them. Those symptoms may not develop until your teens or even 20s. The most common first sign is that severe sudden headache, the worst headache of your life, and can be indicative of a bleed. Other symptoms can be seizures, weakness, numbness, speech troubles, depending on where the AVM is located, and then occasionally they're found incidentally on, on imaging that may have been done for another reason. In our patient's case, her AVM, she had no idea that she even had it. It ruptured, causing bleeding into her brain all of a sudden, and this is the classic presentation of an AVM. In her case, blood entered the ventricles or the fluid-filled space of the brain, which caused her to decompensate, and this can become rapidly fatal if left untreated. Once a patient presents with a hemorrhage, the workup starts fast. First, we get a CAT scan of the brain to quickly identify what may be going on. This is followed usually by something called a CTA, where we inject dye and then do a scan to look at the blood vessels, and that can detect, and that can detect abnormal problems in the blood vessel system, like an AVM or an aneurysm. For AVMs is something called angiography. It maps the AVM in detail. It looks at the feeding arteries, the draining veins, and something called the nidus or the body of the AVM. And when we're looking at AVMs as a surgeon, we grade them by something called the Spetzler-Martin scale. That helps determine the surgical risk of removing this based on size, location, and venous drainage. And it's based on those three things. The size of the AVM, whether or not it's in an eloquent cortex of the brain like speech or movement, and if the veins drain deep or superficial. And we add those points up one to five where the lower scores mean it's a little safer for surgery and the higher scores mean it's a higher risk. So we may potentially look at other treatments. And the treatments really depend on the AVM size, location, and whether or not it's ruptured. And when we treat it may also depend on a variable of factors. The goal is simple to stop high pressure blood flow from rushing into those weak blood vessels before they rupture. One option to treat an AVM is by a traditional craniotomy where we open up the brain, we go in there, and we remove the AVM surgically. We use microscopes, neuronavigation, and sometimes special dyes to see those blood tangles very clearly. And the goal is to disconnect the arteries from the veins that are abnormal and shut down that shortcut in the brain circulation without damaging the healthy tissue around it. And once the AVM is gone, blood flow returns back to normal and that reduces the chance of rupture or stroke. Most patients after a craniotomy will spend a few days in the ICU for close monitoring, and when everything goes right, that AVM is gone for good.
Another option is through something called embolization or coiling, where we feed a tiny catheter thinner than a piece of spaghetti through an artery in the groin or wrist all the way up into the brain to the AVN, where we'll then inject a special material like medical glue or even tiny coils to block off those abnormal connections. And by sealing those vessels, we redirect blood flow into the normal circulation and reduce the risk of rupture or stroke. And the key is precision. You want to close off the AVM, but not those healthy arteries that feed your brain. And yet another way we can treat an AVM is by something called radiosurgery, but don't let the name fool you. There is no incision. We use precisely targeted radiation like a laser made of x-rays to damage those abnormal blood vessels just enough to where they'll slowly close over time. And it's a painless outpatient procedure that can take over one to three years for those tiny vessels to seal shut, reducing the risk of bleeding or stroke. Now back to our patient. After a rupture like this with a large blood clot putting pressure on the brain, our immediate goal is to stabilize her, to control her into cranial pressure, and we will drain pressure on the brain with something called an external ventricular drain. That relieves the pressure on the brain and will decrease the risk of the brain swelling and that could potentially kill her. We'll also tightly regulate her blood pressure to prevent additional bleeding. Now, I mentioned she had a GCS of 10. That's something called the Glasgow Coma Score. And that's how we grade how alert and how severe a patient's brain injury is. A GCS of 10 means she's partially responsive. Not fully alert, but not fully unresponsive either. It's kind of the gray zone between mild and severe brain injury. And without emergent attention, she could quickly decompensate. So she was placed in the intensive care unit. We stabilized her blood pressure and we placed the EVD. And we then took her to angiography so we could further identify the blood flow and the vessel anatomy of her AVM before she was treated. She spent a few weeks in the ICU and she's still recovering. Once an AVM bleeds, the risk of another rupture increases to about 6% in the first year and 2-4% to annually afterwards. Now, mortality from an AVM bleed can reach up to 10-15% to and up to half of survivors will live with some degree of a neurological deficit. And that's why early detection and management are critical. An AVM or that tangle of abnormal vessels can leak small amounts of blood even before a full rupture happens. These tiny little leaks are something called microbleeds or sentinel hemorrhages. They can irritate the nearby brain tissue and can cause headaches, vision changes, weakness, or even small seizures. Symptoms that can get brushed off as stress or migraines. But here's the truth. Those tiny little bleeds can come before a catastrophic hemorrhage. So if something feels off, get it checked out. October is AVM Awareness Month, and this condition deserves more attention. Too many young people lose their lives or live with disability because of these malformations. And this month, I am partnering with the Aneurysm and AVM Foundation, also called the TAAF, and they are helping the fight to end deaths from ruptured brain AVMs and aneurysms by funding research, empowering survivors, and raising awareness that can literally save lives. And we partnered together to design this t-shirt and crew neck sweatshirt and a portion of the proceeds from this circle of Willis design will go to their organization to help fight the cause. AVMs don't always cause symptoms, but when they do, it can be too late. Another case of patient focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.